Yesterday's lecture covered about 2,400 years from the start of the first recorded Chinese uh, dynasty, the Shang, to the end of the Tang dynasty around 900 CE. Now we're slowing down today, but not much. I've mentioned in two lectures now that the Tang dynasty was officially Buddhist and that Tang rulers supported Buddhist monasteries and served as patrons of much important Buddhist art. Another very important form of art that emerges around this period, actually a little before the Tang dynasty, is the painted scroll. This is a non-required work, but it's a hand scroll, which is horizontal and meant to be unrolled and studied. There are also vertical rolls. Hand scrolls were usually made of silk, although as paper technology improved, more would be made from paper. They were read from right to left. Now, since we're getting close to the semester final, let me throw out a review question. What other art that we've studied needs to be read from right to left? There's the Quran written in Arabic, and here's the Golden Haggadah written in Hebrew. Another left-right work will show up in my lecture on Japan. So the Chinese considered calligraphy to be a higher art than painting, partly because the Chinese valued the written word so highly, and partly because it revealed the artist's status. Frequently, calligraphy was added to a scroll, contributing some words or poetry or commentary. That's the colophon. The Tang Dynasty fell in 907 CE, and for about half a century, China splintered again into smaller states. In 960, much of China was reunited under the Sung Dynasty. Gradually, non-Chinese people from the north and the west took over chunks of northern China, but the south remained under the control of the Song for about 150 more years. Despite the threat of invasion and continued military weakness, this was a vibrant time culturally for the Chinese. Scroll painting remained a very important art form, especially in the emperor's court. But the Sung Dynasty saw the emergence of landscape painting as a dominant genre. Now, these are not required works. And by the way, I include the uh, medieval manuscript to give a kind of comparison. Uh, but Li Cheng was considered one of the great masters of the art form. The rise of landscape painting as opposed to portrait painting may have reflected some social and intellectual changes that were taking place in China at the time. While land-owning aristocrats were still a major force in China, the exam system was giving rise to something of a meritocracy. Occasionally, a very bright young man of less elevated birth would rise through sheer brilliance and success on the examination system. These individuals came to be known as the literati, and they would remain a dominant force in Chinese society for several years. I mean, excuse me, for several hundred years. This is China we're talking about. Okay, I am finally getting to a required work, but I felt needed some context because part of what makes this work so important and Fan Quan as an artist so important are the ways that he broke with Li Cheng and other Chinese landscape pattern painters whose work he had early, earlier admired and apparently imitated. We don't know a lot about Fan Quan, but apparently he was an academy painter attached to the court who decided to leave the court and live as a recluse in nature. He was a follower of Taoism. So how does this show up in his work and in his personal life? Ouch. This is a complicated slide, but it's important background information. The focus on living in nature and developing one's inner life is very Taoist. But Fan Quan was also associated with another very Chinese synthesis. We talked about the Han synthesis before. This is known as Neo-Confucianism. This gets deep and complicated, and I'll be honest, even after doing a lot of reading, I'm not at all sure I get it myself, especially the difference between portraying nature directly and portraying nature's essential li and qi. So let's try to wrap our minds around it this way. I'm going to show you two required works for the 19th century. Stay tuned after Christmas. One is from the U.S. and one is from Mexico. Both are examples of romantic landscape painting. Here's the U.S. work, an example of what's called the Hudson River School. Stay tuned. And here is a Mexican painting a little later, but representing pretty much the same art historical period. So what do these two works have in common with the Fan Quan landscape, which I'm assuming you have opened in your workbooks? Well, they're both dramatic. They both include strong values, that is, contrasting shading of light and dark. Although, of course, Fan Quan's ink painting is monochromatic, and these are colored. 
All three of these works also include tiny human figures, and each work portrayed as a part of nature, but also as fundamentally dwarfed by nature. The figure on the upper left, by the way, is a self-portrait of the artist. The mule train on the bottom from Fan Quan's painting may be a group of pilgrims traveling to a Taoist or Buddhist monastery, which were often located in the mountains. But Fan Quan's painting plays with our perspective in a way that the other two 19th century paintings do not. This painting is essentially divided into three registers, a little bit like that uh, funeral banner, right? Each is painted with different kinds of brush strokes, and each presents a somewhat different perspective. This is not a vision you could get from standing in a single place. Moreover, each area of light and dark occupies different spaces. They really don't connect. And finally, each section uses distinctly different brushstrokes. The foreground at eye level has what one art historian has called crisp, well-defined brushstrokes. The misty, large central area with the mountains is executed in a pale ink wash, which is produced by diluting the ink with water. What are called raindrop texture strokes capture the vertical cliffs. The artist also uses different kinds of brush strokes to portray different kinds of trees. Okay, another back to the future moment, sorry. By the time we get to our whopping 27 global contemporary works, which I will tell you up front, I think is too many, uh, we're all gonna be gasping for breath. So I've been trying to introduce some of these works earlier in the course. So why do you think I put these two works together? What do they have in common? Well, the artist of the work on the left is Korean, not Chinese, but ink wash or literati painting was very popular in Korea as well as China. As you'll hear soon, Korean art was in general heavily influenced by developments in China. This artist was quite deliberately using traditional Asian ink wash methods, that is the 20th century artist, even though the work also reflects the influence of 20th century abstract art. Song Sunam was a leader of Korea's Sumukwa, or Oriental Ink Movement, in the 1980s. That term is the Korean pronunciation of the Chinese word for ink wash painting, also called literati painting. Think maybe the College Board will ask you to draw a connection? I would not bet against it. Next dynasty, please. The Chinese name notwithstanding, the Yuan Dynasty was the first foreign dynasty to rule China, and it ruled until 1365. The first ruler of the Yuan dynasty was Kublai Khan, the grandson of the famed conqueror Genghis Khan, and host of Marco Polo, whose description of China under Kublai Khan excited a young fellow named Christopher Columbus. The Mongols don't always have a good rap, and for some good reasons, but Mongol rule actually brought important benefits to China. For art history, it was mostly good news. This map tells you why. Any guess? Basically, the Mongol Empire was divided up among Genghis Khan's grandsons, but they were sufficiently united to protect the traffic on the Silk Road. With secure trade routes, economic and cultural exchange flourished in this period, even if some of the literati lost their jobs and withdrew to their country homes to pout. It's often called the Pax Mongolica. It was the Yuan Dynasty that moved China's capital to Beijing, by the way, closer to their Mongolian home. So the David vases, our next required work, were probably the best, are probably the best known porcelain vases in the world because of the rare inscriptions around their necks, which date these works very precisely, 1351 CE. They were named after the famous British collector who uh, bought them up in the 1920s when the Chinese empire had disintegrated and palace eunuchs had started selling off imperial art. He donated them eventually to the British Museum. We know from the inscription that these were originally altar vases commissioned by a man named Zhang Wenjin and presented as an offering to a Taoist temple. And this is important, the fact that we have such specific uh, provenance for this work is one of the reasons I suspect it was chosen by the College Board. The vases also tell in a microcosm the story of art in the Yuan dynasty. We now think of blue and white porcelain as quintessentially Chinese, but actually this now archetypal Chinese aesthetic, which by the way was also borrowed by the Dutch, actually comes from Iran, where it had long been popular. Remember the mirab that originally stood in an Isfahan mosque and is now in the Met? I just saw it a couple days ago. It's from the same period. 
Chinese merchants were eager to sell to this rich market, and with Mongol armies guarding the Silk Road, they could get their goods to this market safely. Iranian mines also gave Chinese the cobalt they needed to put the blue into their porcelain. What the Chinese brought to the exchange was porcelain technology. Now, the technology had long existed to produce fine porcelain from kaolin, or fine white clay. But adding color decoration presented some serious problems because few substances could withstand the high temperature that was needed to fire kaolin into porcelain. In the Yuan period, Chinese ceramicists discovered that ground cobalt could be mixed with water and painted on an unfired piece of porcelain. In the kiln, the blackish pigment turned a rich shade of blue. This innovation began the famous tradition of blue and white ware, which for centuries would be created for markets in China, the Muslim countries, and in Europe. Copper oxide was also used successfully as a decorative agent in the same way, creating the class of porcelains known as underglaze red. The imperial kilns in Jiangxi province became the most renowned center for porcelain, not only in China, but in the world. So I've mentioned that the David vases were made for a Taoist temple, so the imagery is not surprisingly very Chinese. We see our old friends the phoenix and the dragon. These items were not made for the imperial household, but the phoenix and dragon nevertheless traditionally represent the empress and the emperor. But what is their greater significance in Taoism? The phoenix often represents the yin, passive female energy, and the dragon represents the yang, or active masculine energy. Remember my earlier disclaimer about this. I'm not a Taoist. In my experience, women have plenty of active energy. So I'm going to pause here so that I don't choke YouTube. In my final and I hope shorter lecture on Chinese art, I will talk about the Forbidden City and the formidable Chairman Mao.